I'm going to preach an entire book of the Bible to you. But lucky for you, the whole book is only 25 verses long. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Let me summarize the backstory uh, of the epistle that we know as Philemon, which is uh, kind of the companion piece to Colossians. Philemon is a short, punchy little address to a prominent member of the Colossian church, a man named Philemon. Like most reasonably well-to-do people of the time and place, Philemon had slaves and had been the master of one particular servant whose name was Onesimus. Onesimus had somehow wronged his master. Uh, we don't really know all the details. They're not 100% clear. Um, maybe, maybe he stole something from his master, but Onesimus subsequently made the decision uh, to flee from Philemon's household. And along his way, perhaps by his own design, he met up with Paul, who was in prison at the time. And the two struck up a relationship, and soon Onesimus became very dear to Paul. And in verse 10, Paul says that he became like a father to Onesimus, and Onesimus was like his own child. Onesimus uh, was a help to the incarcerated Paul, who continued to minister and spread the gospel from his prison cell. But with the delivery of this little letter, the letter of Philemon, Paul had sent Onesimus back to Colossae, back to his former master Philemon. It was a chancy prospect for Onesimus, who could be legally punished for his running away. And in the letter he sends, Paul uh, addresses Philemon. He offers some gracious praise of the former master for being a godly person. He says he's a partner in ministry, someone with whom he is in family fellowship through Jesus. And then Paul makes a bold request, and it is a request. It's not a forceful demand using his apostolic authority for leverage, but rather it's a humble request in love as a brother that Philemon welcome back his runaway slave Onesimus as his brother. Not welcome him back into the household as a slave, but maybe skipping giving him the beating or the thrashing for his running away, but rather welcome him back as a beloved equal, as family. Uh, this is a radical appeal for Paul to make. It was personally costly to Paul, who was losing the assistance of Onesimus, who had been a huge help to him as he ministered from prison. But even more so, this sort of thing just would not normally be done. Slaves were owned. They were possessions. They were farm equipment or cattle. They were the legal property of their masters, uh, unless and until the master decided to issue them their freedom. And Paul says to welcome him back like he's your bro. He's urging a profound and difficult kind of reconciliation. In the letter Paul wrote to Philemon's home church, Colossians, Paul includes there a set of instructions that were pointed toward the whole community. He names and he addresses husbands and wives and children and slaves and masters talking about what it might look like for them, each of them, to live faithfully as followers of Jesus. And the very fact that Paul is addressing all of these people at the same time, the fact that all of these types of people would have been in the same room at that same moment, to hear that letter read aloud to them is in and of itself a remarkable witness to the kind of peculiar community that was evolving in the early church. A typical gathering in first century Roman society would practically never see class lines broken to address an assembly of such a variety of people. Colossians 3, the end of Colossians 3 and the start of Colossians 4 addresses not just the men, but the women and the children and the slaves as real participants in the faith community. They're all people of equal value, each with agency and a freedom through Christ so that they can choose how they will conduct themselves in this life of fellowship. It's beautiful and it's actually totally revolutionary. Imagine now a, a group gathered 
people of all kinds of social status, of varying economic means, rich, poor, of different racial and cultural backgrounds, but seen in that gathering as complete and mutually treasured equals. That's what church is supposed to look like. And now, here in the letter to Philemon, in this one particular example come to life, the peculiarity of Christian community and fellowship is given an even sharper pinpoint. A transgressed master should welcome back into his home and church an offending, runaway slave as his brother. Philemon is, it's like the Magna Carta of the New Testament. In verse 6, Paul writes, I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. For Paul, the logical implications of a faith in Jesus, the faith that he and Philemon and Onesimus all share, uh, is a remarkable and lavish outpouring of generosity to other people. A generosity that looks like forgiveness and hospitality and grace. For Paul, deep belief in the true goodness that God has made available free of charge means that Philemon can extend goodness to another person, even if it's to Onesimus, his runaway slave. I wonder, who do you need to extend some grace to? Who do you need to set free? Who has wronged you in some way that God is inviting you to offer emancipation and freedom through forgiveness? Who have you believed? is your inferior, but now out of the grace you yourself have received from God can understand as your equal, your brother or your sister. Paul's also a, a savvy chap and a just one too. He recognizes that Philemon might be taking a loss in liberating Onesimus and receiving him as a brother rather than back as a slave. Plus, uh, maybe whatever Onesimus might have skimmed off of Philemon's account before he skipped town. And Paul, in love and in justice, offers to himself repay any loss that Philemon experiences in releasing and receiving Onesimus as his brother. Paul says that he will bear the cost. He will take responsibility for whatever wrong Onesimus has committed against his former master. Now, who does that sound like? Who do you know? that was willing to bear the transgressions of another in order to secure them a new life of freedom? Sunday school answer, Jesus, right? Paul is through this offer willing to become like Christ. He's living out the gospel in this moment, making a sacrifice of his own life, setting aside his own rights and his own security in order to secure the well-being of his friend Onesimus. I wonder if there's something there for us to chew on, too. Uh, the news in your social media feed, maybe as of late, has already had you thinking about some of this to some degree. But what does it look like for you to advocate for the well-being of another, of, of an individual, uh, of a community, of a people group? What does it look like? to willingly lay aside your own privilege for the sake of pursuing another's liberty or another's equality or another, uh, another's experience of God's best. Philemon's been the surprise book for me personally so far in this Dear Church series looking at the letters of the New Testament. This little letter to a man named Philemon, uh, I believe it gives us some big challenges on how the gospel transforms our relationships, on how it transforms our churches, how it transforms our community, how it even transforms our society. May God's will be done all over the earth, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit.